Yeah, really glad to be here today, and thank you, Julia and uh, Oleg, for having me and having this great panel here. Um, I'm unfortunately a little bit under the weather today, so my voice is, is, a, is a bit down, and I, I think I'm developing a bit of fever. So if I just miss it in the middle of uh, my sentence, Julia, just remind me where I am, who I am. Um, but yeah, without uh, further ado, um, quick self-intro. So um, my games, uh, we are publisher of uh, Western uh, casual mobile games in Chinese market. Um, so that's, that's my background. We are just focused on that one geographical market and just that, that one uh, genre of games. But our panel here is, is actually very diverse and we have some amazing companies, uh, both big and uh, uh, slightly smaller ones um, and, and, and with the different backgrounds. So I would like to ask our panelists to uh, do a self-introduction round, uh, starting from uh, Chris here. And uh, if you could include like a uh, bit of company introduction and then your publishing um, background, maybe your key titles that uh, people uh, might know you for, and then um, what platforms you are focused on, what geographical markets you are focused on, uh, any s specific genres that you are looking at in your in your publishing, um, and then we can uh, take it from there. So thanks, Chris. Okay, my my name is Chris Keeling. Uh, I work at Wargaming.net, a small company you probably never heard of. Okay, everybody's heard of it here, right? Um, and we make World of Tanks, World of Warships, World of Warplanes. But actually, we've been around for um, it'll be 20 years this year. So we've made a lot of games before that you may not have heard of. We've just started, because of the explosion of the popularity of our games recently in the free-to-play space, Re by recently I mean over the last seven or eight years, um, we've grown to a size where we feel like we have something to offer as a publisher. So we're pretty new to the publishing space. We we're used to being on the end of the developer. So we know what it's like to be a developer who's looking for a publisher. And now we have you know, 150 million um, different ac accounts, player accounts on our games, and we have um, experience in the mobile space, console, PC, and um, so we've started looking at publishing games that are being made by other people, and we've just uh, done a few so far, and we have several more in the pipeline, and we're, some of them are joint ventures, and some of them are um, actually, you know, coming from a third party where they, where we're providing almost nothing except the publishing, but we can do everything in between from um, full-scale support to um, just the publishing, uh, including, of course, investment and other opportunities. What else do you need? And, and do you have any of these uh, games live yet, or are they in, uh, just... So, for example, we did, uh, on mobile, we did uh, Guys in Glory. It was a, a third-party game that, uh, that came to us, and uh, we, we published that mostly, it was mostly successful uh, here in the CIS. We also uh, more recently uh, launched uh, Total War Arena, which we picked up from Sony. Um, we have uh, also announced a project that we're doing as a co-development with uh, 1C in Moscow uh, called Caliber, first person shooter. And those are the ones we have announced and we have, we have others as well that are in progress. Awesome. Yeah, we can go more into details on uh, the next round. Um, all right, thanks. Uh, Mike. Hello, my name is Mike Sibov. I'm a publishing manager in Zeptolab. Maybe you know our company from uh, Katvarov franchise. We have more than one billion of installs. We are focusing on mobile free-to-play publishing. And um, <coughs> that's all. <laughs> Um, um, as for genres, uh, we are looking for uh, mid-core uh, mobile free-to-play games. We don't want to be a great publisher with huge pro uh, with a huge amount of products. We just want to find one or two projects uh, in a year and focus on it and work with them as uh, they are uh, our own project. Uh, what was your your key reason, Mike, for uh, going into publishing third-party uh, games? 
Uh, excuse me, one, one more. Uh, why did you choose to uh, start the uh, So we, um, as you know, we, uh, first of all, we are developer. Uh, so we make games and we love games. And um, so one day we realized that we uh, have a, a huge experience in uh, marketing and we have a good um, relationship with uh, some uh, stores, with Apple Store, with Google Play. And we know what uh, they want uh, from developers and we understand that we can help help uh, our developers to get uh, some uh, experience uh, and to go to top uh, top grossing. <laughs> uh, so uh, we, tr we try to help developers with um, what they really need. So if they need um, money, we can give them money. If they need our experience in product, we have good product team and they can uh, share their experience with uh, new developers. If they need uh, translation, uh, quality uh, control support, we can also share our, our own uh, team for developer. All right, so very similar to War gaming that you are just leveraging your, uh, your but we, resources. But, but uh, we are not uh, <laughs> really concurrents because uh, war gaming is much bigger than, than, <laughs> than us, and, and we just want to focus on several projects, not, not a great amount. We have not a great publishing uh, division, it's about 10, 10 people. Sure. All right, thanks. And Tatiana? Hi everyone, my name is Tatiana, I'm from G5 Games. G5 is a Swe Swedish public company with seven offices around the world, so we are pure mobile publisher. Um, the main genres are hidden object, match three, uh, um, casual games. Um, what else? The, the, the markets, uh, half of market major markets is still US, but uh, the other two great markets which we have is China and Japan. What else? <laughs> um, that's good. Thanks. <laughs> all right, Alexander. Yeah, hi all, my name is Alex. Um, I'm from Creative Mobile Company. Uh, Creative Mobile is a, a not so big company, around 100 uh, um, employees. It is located in Estonia and uh, we are focused on uh, mobile markets, uh, especially App Store and Google Play. Um, well, mm, the company uh, has become uh, well known for uh, creating the first drag racing uh, game on mobile. Um, well, I think it was in 2011. Uh, and in 2013, we have decided to um, create a publishing department uh, to share our expertise, to diversify uh, genres we were working uh, with. And uh, uh, lately, we are looking almost for any genre. Uh, for example, uh, super casual, uh, which is really trendy right now, it is also an option for us. And uh, I think that's it. All right, thanks. Uh, Miley. Hi, um, everyone. Um, I'm Miley Chim. Uh, I'm my, uh, Europe Mobile BD Lead for NetEase. Uh, we're a developer and publisher from China. Um, NetEase was actually founded as a news and email company back in 1997. And we're also the first Chinese company to develop MMORPG. Uh, the company has very hardcore development background and we're also a developer approach to a publisher because we have so many contents uh, to do, uh, to publish. Uh, we entered the mobile space uh, very late uh, until 2013 when there is a supercell of Rovio, all those giant company and everyone say that you guys only know PC and I still remember two years ago when I traveled in Europe, um, I pitched to lots of developers where NetEase and everyone said, sorry. <laughs> And uh, now currently we're working with uh, uh, more young for the Minecraft. Uh, we're working with Wargaming for World of Tens. So we're looking for hot cores which have a strong monetization. We also work with lots of indie studios such as Fireproof uh, for the Room O Things and 22 Cans for the Trail. And for those indie projects, we support lots of development to scale the, the project and hope uh, we can share that some of the, our experience here today. Thank you. 
All right. And are, are you focused uh, mainly on the Chinese market, or do you also bring uh, Chinese games to the overseas market? So for third-party games, we're currently focusing Asia only, and uh, we're trying to self-publish our games in the global. Uh, but I would say that for the Western market, we're, we just started like two years, so we're still a baby. And uh, so I would say that for third-party uh, global publishing, that would be our next step. All right, so be aware, guys. They're coming. <laughs> All right, thanks. Um, on the morning, uh, morning investor panel, there was uh, interesting discussions about uh, the, what kind of uh, business uh, knowledge uh, the uh, free-to-play uh, game teams uh, must have nowadays. Um, when you choose, a, a, first of all, do you uh, focus on free-to-play? And when you choose uh, a developer uh, to part develop the work with, um, how much you expect them to have those um, sort of uh, game business understanding uh, in, in uh, balancing the monetization mechanics, doing the user acquisition, the analytics part, um, marketing, or is that something that uh, you expect to cover in every project? Anyone? Can I? Me? Okay. So, first of all, each new game, each next game for publishing deal shouldn't cannibalize the previous game which we have already in portfolio. Um, but according to the development experience, we don't have a lot of. Um, um, we don't expect them to know a lot about monetization because this is a, a publisher deal. So, at first, the game should be. Good. If the game is crappy from the beginning, there is no monetization instrument which can help. Right. That's it. I absolutely agree with Tatiana because uh, it is a publisher who knows a lot about business, about monetization, and uh, about uh, marketing things. And uh, for developers, we are waiting for uh, them that they make good games, and it's quite enough for for our interest. We're, we're also pretty heavily focused <clears throat> on free-to-play, and we like to publish free-to-play games uh, because we have that experience, and we, we're fine offering that experience to the studio, but we do expect them to come in with a solid model that is integrated into their core gameplay, because if they come in with just a game, adding that monetization system, even if it's a good game, right, adding that monetization system in there is going to change the whole game. So they really have to already have something solid in there that we can work with and help them balance it and, and, and put it into play so that it's functional and profitable. And, and what kind of metrics you are looking at there uh, when you choose the game? Well, the, the problem usually is that we don't have any metrics right. because it hasn't been made yet. So we have to go by uh, our experienced, uh, our experts in free-to-play who actually will go visit the studio and, and talk to them about their, their models and uh, help them to you know, bring them to a, a successful conclusion. So do you go, go to projects that are maybe only in the concept phase, or does it have to be alpha, beta? Right, right now, we're looking for projects that are about 80% done and haven't launched yet. So we can offer uh, last, fu last funding, uh, final support, polish, help with monetization, and then the more traditional publishing of marketing and user acquisition. Yeah, yeah, all right. Um, Miley, I, I think you, you had a case where you are sort of taking the opposite route, that you are taking a game that doesn't even have free-to-play monetization and, and turning that into a free-to-play game. Can you sh share of that? Sure. Yes. Um, so uh, development uh, is net use strength, and our philosophy is that um, we know we're good at monetization, we're good at free to play, but we're not good at innovation. So our idea that why we're looking for games from the West is that um, we really thought a Western developer have very good concept about innovation, uh, while Chinese developer have strong uh, monetization skills. So we want to combine to make a game as much as successful we can. So what we do is that, uh, for example, we work with a Dutch studio. Uh, it's, um, for a premium game, it's called 99 Breaks uh, Wazer Academic. It's a premium game, it's a break game, and we thought the gameplay is 
amazing, and we have a crazy ideas that we want to make it into a free to play, and we want to add PVP feature. Uh, while the studios is too small to support for the Chinese version, so um, we took the source code and we developed every features in China, and uh, so um, to to scale the project into the next level. And, and was that successful? Um, turn, turning that game into free to play was that successful? Yes. So uh, uh, Apple gives a very uh, good features, and we also do a lot of uh, user acquisitions. And the games uh, was, I'm not sure if you heard of it in the Western market, but it went to the top one, top chart in the first way. Awesome. In Congrats. China. Yeah. Uh, so did you only publish that in China then, or, or also bring it to other markets? Uh, so for that game, we're only published in China. Uh, for the project we signed, such as the Room O scenes, that is more new project, or it's more like in Asia, yeah. like Japan, Korea, and so. All right. Yeah. I'm curious to know because, um, uh, per my experience, a lot of the Western developers they often have this uh, concept of uh, fair gameplay, and and they are very shy at uh, monetizing the the players and and. Definitely no no go for for pay to win type of monetization, whereas Chinese <coughs> Chinese are very good at uh, squeezing the last drop of of money from the player. Um, so, is there any any conflict on on that when you when you engage with the with the developers uh, here in in Europe, and uh, how do you handle with that? Um, I would say we we actually map very different kind of developer. Some of uh, developer, they are uh, very open-minded or they are too busy. So uh, they will say, like Konami, they will say, we don't have resource and we don't have time for China. So, you know, um, do whatever you like. And of course, we show them our plans and we just keep them updated. So um, in that case, because we're also a developer, so which means we can have our development going very efficient in China, everything do by ourselves. And uh, some of the developers also very scared, like, no, don't change, don't change anything. And don't change the monetization, uh, don't change the gameplay, I don't want a PvP feature. But in that point of view that if you don't have the uh, understanding that what would be the best in the market, and if you never try, you will never know. Yeah. So we spend lots of effort uh, for every developer before we convince them that what we want to do. All right. Good. Yeah. Um, what about Alexander? Uh, what do you what do you sort of uh, bring to the table for the for the developers and and how much you you get involved in in modifying developing the game? Uh, well. Uh, um, as I said previously, we are also uh, focused on free-to-play games, uh, but uh, right now um, we think that we can uh, do so much more. Uh, and so we decided to look for almost any genre, uh, starting from super casual, and also uh, we, ha for example, we had a, a really good experience. I would, I would say it was a successful story, publishing a premium game on mobile. Uh, the game was called uh, is called uh, Beholder. It came from Steam, um, and we managed uh, to publish it successfully in the era era of uh, uh, really hard, uh, uh, I would say, destiny of premium games on mobile. Uh, we uh, invest our uh, expertise and experience from our game designers and producers, and uh, we uh, do our best. Um, to make the game be better, um, uh, it may touch uh, like all of the aspects, starting from monetization and uh, ending the way, uh, for example, like uh, UI looks. Um, so, uh, in most cases, uh, uh, we can explain uh, the developer why it is needed, and uh, we don't have any problems changing anything uh, in the game. Uh, we do user acquisition, uh, but uh, we uh, we do it only if the game is uh, uh, really good and has really good metrics uh, after the soft launch. Uh, if the metrics are worse than uh, we expected or worse than average, uh, it has no sense to do user acquisition. Uh, but of course, we, we do marketing. We do uh, uh, anything uh, related to ESO. 
I mean, uh, app store optimization, like screenshots, icons, or we can, um, it, it is also negotiable, uh, we can uh, ask developer, uh, for example, uh, to, to make good screenshots, uh, because they know their product, and for example, the art style, they can do it better. And sometimes we do it ourselves. So it's like uh, on the edge of uh, making sense. All right, so it sounds like it's, it's a lot of uh, case, by, case by case. Yes, uh, it's change. absolutely different every time. All right, cool. So question for all of you is, um, how do you choose a game and, and, a, and a team to work with? What, what are the key, key things that you are looking, looking at the game and, and in the team? Okay. <laughs> First of all, the game have to suit our loyal audience. I mean, uh, if developer wants G5 to be a publisher, I would recommend at first to review our portfolio because sometimes it doesn't suit at all and there is no reason to speak with us. Um, <clears throat> and if the game is really for our target audience, yeah, we can discuss. We have a certain internal <coughs> processes. Uh, reviewing the game. We start reviewing the game from first playable demo. All right. The sooner we start working together, the better for both sides. Uh, we, yeah, we invest a lot and uh, it's like co-development. It's not only um, publishing, putting on a store and doing nothing. No, uh, we would recommend everything regarding monetization. Um, we need to reach a certain quality, uh, or, which we know. <laughs> um, and um, we have a final creative control. So, so are you uh, then, <coughs> then working with, with teams only, teams, teams that are uh, geographically close to you that you can work very closely with? That's or? not necessary. No, we're quite open-minded and uh, we work with a lot of different countries. Uh, all our producers speak at least English, so we can weather the external teams and spend one, two weeks together in order to find the best way of collaboration. Yeah. So, 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 what, <coughs> so, let's say the team sends you the first playable demo. Uh, does it have need to have uh, monetization mechanics in place? Um, no. Uh, I don't expect a like full polished game. Otherwise, why this developer need a publisher? Uh, no, I don't. Uh, no, uh, it would be nice if, if there at least will be some ideas of what kind of monetization it's already um, in the mind of developer. And how long? Like like you mentioned, you you invest a lot on the on the game project, um, do you start already sort of in investing a lot of time before you sign the deal? Um, mm, or, or do no. You have, do you have a very, very <laughs> I wouldn't recommend to do this. <laughs> do, you, do you have a very quick, prudent uh, way to uh, evaluate the case that, okay, we don't wanna want this, we want this? Unfortunately, it's not like really fluent uh, because we're quite big and the process um, takes some time. Uh, and we're constantly somewhere in events. So, <laughs> yeah, it would take at least two weeks, three weeks, forget and then like yes or no. And if it, if it that's, that's yes, when we start discussing the contract, when it's signed, yeah, we start works. Yeah, all right, cool. Others? As for our, our company, we also have uh, some internal uh, process. And then we receive a playable demo. We uh, share it with, uh, with uh, our product managers, and we decide uh, if uh, the game have some potential on our side or not. Uh, if uh, the game seems interesting for us, we decide to make soft launch or secret launch together. We help uh, the developer to integrate uh, good analytics, analytics uh, help with, for, uh, with monetization and so on, and give some uh, initial traffic in one uh, small country, and uh, look at the metrics and see what we can do with these metrics. And if we see the potential uh, after soft launch, we sign contract and go uh, to deep development and to global launch together. 
And, and you mentioned earlier that you have very uh, strict requirements in terms of the quality. <laughs> yep, yep. Uh, <clears throat> ZetaLab is uh, well known uh, as uh, the quality um, quality projects company, and we focus on uh, graphic quality and game design quality. We don't uh, want to publish uh, clones. We just want to find some unique game or uh, some. Uh, merged genres or which uh, give uh, the game unique uh, <coughs> gameplay. So uh, there are a lot of uh, incoming tickets, incoming letters for our publishing division, but not uh, all of them are suitable for us. So you, you have already one, uh, one sort of uh, massive IP, Omnom, and then you have uh, um, um, and cats, as and cats and the uh, uh, King of Thieves. Uh, are you actively like looking looking for uh, new IPs from third-party developers, or is it more like you are looking for gameplay that could match your existing IPs? Mm, it's uh, both. We are looking for games like Cats. It's ideal for us, but we also can share our IPs for for the developers. If we uh, find some gameplay which uh, looks fresh and uh, can be attractive, we can uh, integrate our Omnom into this game, and we uh, already uh, have some tests, and the result is good. So we know that the adding our our uh, recognizable uh, Omnom to another game uh, helps them in, uh, to, get, to get better metrics. Absolutely. Great. Uh, how about Chris? So uh, to me, it, a publisher is an investor, right? Just like the it talk about investment that we talked about that we had here earlier, um, you have to look at exactly the same kinds of things. You're looking at the team quality, the game quality. You're looking at the um, what they bring to the table. We always send people there uh, to evaluate the team and to uh, evaluate their technical pipeline, their uh, expertise in that area, like development directors, lead programmers, um, and want to understand the team behind the game. So is it a good game, but also can this team bring it to launch and support it and sustain it? Uh, because we are investing in the game. We're investing in bringing the, bringing the game to launch and also putting our reputation on the line that this is going to be a good game that our players will want to play. So. We do a lot of kind of background checking on on the organization as well as making sure that the game itself is something that we want to publish. And of course, it should fit into war gaming, right? It's, uh, it should be at least a, some kind of a strategy game or military game, um, whether it's modern or vehicles, tanks or not, it doesn't matter, but just something that's, uh, that fits the war gaming brand. As long as there's a gun. <laughs> yeah, guns are good. May, may I ask a question? So we are talking a lot about how you guys, how you publishers choose the games, right? And uh, the team should be solid, the project should be interesting, and a lot of stuff. But uh, let's look at this from the developer perspective. And um, if we're not considering investing and uh, speaking about just publishing, what exactly, what value does a publisher bring to a free-to-play game developer right now? Tatiana, why do we need a publisher at all? I can continue. <laughs> no, 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 no. Stop. <laughs> <laughs> because I can forget the, the beginning. Exactly. <laughs> okay. um, why developer need a publisher? I wouldn't say that all developer needs a publisher. But um, if developer has Enough expertise uh, in free-to-play, balance or monetization, etc. Um, have separate user acquisition team, has a support team, has a live ops team, has <laughs> localization team, both for games and for the marketing materials. So probably they don't need it. That all sounds good, except one thing is that um, all this stuff is needed only if the game performs well. I mean, if the game performs badly, no one would invest money into UA or Livebox or anything, right? And if a developer already has a game that actually performs well, again, why do you need a publisher? Sometimes they like stuck in the progress. Um, yeah. A lot of developers, uh, before um, they said 
listen, this, we have a game, and uh, I see that it looks nice, and it suits me. It suits me as a publisher, but uh, they. Say we don't know how to how to improve the game. We don't know where to really? go further. Really? Yeah, it is. So yes. we need we need traffic. We need uh, user That's, acquisition. Yeah. Uh -huh. uh, we don't know how how to do it. We don't we don't have this expert expertise. They can like waste millions of dollars in on user acquisition and get it like zero as a result. So they, in this case, they go to publishers and said, "Listen, we don't need even we don't need any finance from your side. Here is a game. Please push it to the market." So, how much um, would you take from the revenue in that case? So you do nothing with the game. You only help push it. Only push it to the market. Only. <laughs> only. Yeah, it's never worked work like this. It's little thing, right? You know, it's never worked like we don't don't participate in a. For instance, from the beginning, we, we won't touch anything. But further, when we start um, more deeply uh, collaborating with the developer, of course, we're going to change something or add some expertise. But uh, the normal, the typical case is a 50-50 rough share. All right. And the question to you, the last one, and uh, to the rest of you. <laughs> Sorry, I, I love talking to you. I haven't seen you for ages, actually. <laughs> but uh, so speaking about this expertise that you add to the game, I'm not speaking about UA, but about the development of the game. So um, if you if you were to evaluate of how much. Um, how much of the game is actually changed because of a publisher? Like, so, for example, a developer comes to you and uh, with a game and you say, okay, you have to change this, this, and that, and then, so, uh, what's, like, the share of the changes that you guys suggest in the end? What, what's happening in the end? Like, 50% of the game is changed, or, like, 20%, but it's, like, the most important stuff. Like, can you evaluate something like that? Give us a number. If 50% has changed, I wouldn't say it's a good deal because it's it's a lot of too much work. Uh, normally, we don't take the core gameplay. Mm -hmm. The core gameplay and the game itself, it's on the developer side. But uh, UI, for instance, uh, some even so we add the monetization aspects, and it's of course uh, you can't avoid touching the the, the game itself. So uh, like 50 percentage, probably 50, 15. I mean. Okay, Mila, does it uh, work the same when you bring a game to the Chinese market, or actually the changes are much bigger? Um, I uh, also agree with uh, Tatiana. Um, we, uh, our philosophy is to uh, keep the original gameplay, that okay. innovation from the Western games um, to China, and then we will. Uh, uh, use our development strengths to add, like, such as uh, PVP feature, um, optimize the tutorial, and uh, adding more events, or even adding some Chinese contents. Like, for example, we work with uh, 22 cans uh, for the Choyo, and it's a game that you explore the world, and so we, uh, we add some Chinese uh, uh, cities, uh, contents in it, and uh, uh, the Chinese and uh, receive very good feedback from Chinese players. So I would say it really depends. We also change the games like 50% uh, when we see the uh, concept, uh, but uh, it, it really depends. I was going to say, you know, if you change so much, why do you need developers? <laughs> I mean, I sorry, why, why developer needs a publisher, right? Yeah. Uh, I would say that it really, um, if you, uh, it really depends on your ambitions. Um, I have seen loads of West, uh, some Western developers, like Playrace, also doing very well in the Chinese market. And the thing is that for China, um, you need a publisher because you need someone to handle the government approval. Um, you can also just put the game live on App Store. Um, you do some user acquisition, but you will never know how the market how you will work for the market. Because if you see the top 10 grossing in China, it's all Chinese company. It's quite funny that um, top 10 grossing games in China, um, it's all Chinese developer and publisher, although that uh, some of them are Japanese IP or PC games IP, but it's all made in China. And uh, if we don't use the strengths or the knowledge that how the local companies make success, if you never work with them, how you will know and be 
better than the yeah, so I want to, yeah. if I can follow up on sure. that. Uh, so, NetEase is very strong uh, traditionally on the MMORPGs and very hardcore games. Um, but there's, like, you can see a lot of, uh, quite, quite, quite a lot of um, uh, Western uh, casual games already in the Chinese market doing all right. Um, but MMORPGs are, are still mostly all, all the Asian IP, mostly it's all, all the Three Kingdoms or, or the Wu Xiao. So have, have you tried uh, taking like uh, Western style uh, MMORPGs uh, into the market and, and what's your experience with that? Uh, we have been taking a look at lots of projects, but it's difficult. And the reason is that um, most of the uh, Western PC games, uh, it's uh, when they design, it's 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 um, uh, the players' difference even from the tutorial. Like the players' uh, difference uh, are really different from Chinese uh, players. So which means that whenever uh, for the uh, MMORPG games from to uh, from West to China, the modification amount of is like enormous and it's very different. And another thing is that um, actually lots of uh, IPs uh, uh, works in the West uh, are not necessary work as well in China. For example, like Witcher, it's not it's a very well single player RPG, but actually it's it's very niche for. Chinese audience. Yeah, yeah. I, I was going to illustrate uh, Miles' um, thought about uh, how non-Chinese company can go to the Chinese market. It's like all Russians here have probably seen uh, Chinese apps that decided to publish on the Russian market and translated them into Russian, and they failed. <laughs> it's actually really funny to, to see them, so I think uh, something similar can happen if you don't have the expertise, right, in the Chinese market, that can happen. But we're gonna talk more about Chinese market uh, on Friday at the White Nights. Actually, Mikhail and uh, Miley will be on the panel too. So maybe we can switch to other topics. Okay, we can save. <laughs> if, we, if, if anyone has, can we take a question? If it's okay. Hi everyone. Thanks for the some some thoughts you provided. Um, uh, I wanted to follow up a bit on a question, which um, I mean, not on a point, which you, Tatiana, raised. That the sooner developers come to you uh, with the prototype or with the demo, the better. But on the other hand, you also said that um, you should. Um, you should at least match the uh, key uh, metrics before doing it. So, where's the truth here? So, should we go uh, with a game which is in a demo or which is in a prototype, the sooner we, the sooner the better, or should we try to test it ourselves and then come up with a game which is kind of ready and get a better deal? Thanks. Uh, I don't remember where I mentioned some key uh, metrics, uh, but anyway, um, as I always say, come come back for, to me with your game when you're, yourself is satisfied with the game. Never. <laughs> Never. <laughs> no, I know, but uh, okay, kind of satisfaction. <laughs> um, still, the sooner you came, the better. So we start so with prototype or not a prototype, already released. Oh. At least a playable demo. At least a playable demo with a core gameplay uh, meta and uh, some explanation at least of what monetization you want to add. What the heck you are going to do with this? Yeah, yeah. How are you going to sell this game? The first question which I'm, I'm going to ask you. How are you going to sell this game? Well, I have an answer. Why do I come to you? Exactly. You don't need me <laughs> in this case. <laughs> All right, Alex, uh, to you. Um, what was the question? I mean, like, uh, <laughs> why, why, uh, why do I when, when is the right time to go to a publisher and right, show uh, what you have? Concept, prototype, already released, soft launch game, what's, when's the um, best time? I can tell only from uh, the experience we had in Creative Mobile. Uh, we never uh, seriously uh, look into concepts, uh, but uh, we prefer to look um, at the games that have at least alpha or better, 
like playable demo. And uh, if uh, a developer has some metrics and, and, and the game was soft launch already, it's like a really good addition um, to the pitch of the game. But if not, it's also okay. Chris, um, such a small company as, uh, as yours, uh, do you work with concepts or it's also out of your interest? So I was going to say that actually the truth lies depending on the uh, publisher. So some publishers will want a very early prototype, Never whereas mind. we're really only interested in games that are far enough along that we can send them out for uh, UX testing, play testing, um, and p potentially into soft launch or alpha. So we want to already see a very mature game before we're willing to invest in it. And but um, we. If I can just, just interrupt, that if, if the developer doesn't have like super clear idea how, the, how they're going to hone the monetization um, or, or you think their idea might be a little bit wrong, you have a better idea, uh, is that a case that you will happily take? Yes, we will actually, we'll actually prefer that. That's why we don't want a game really that's 100%. We don't want it to be finished because we're going to change it anyway. So if you bring it to us at 100%, it's really only 80%. Uh, because we're going to fix your monetization and we're going to do a lot of testing on it and get a lot of player feedback. Um, because this is like going back to the question of what, why you have a publisher, right? Why do you, why do you need a publisher? Um, because we already have all these resources that, uh, that a small team doesn't have. Um, even many large teams don't have. Like we do UX testing in multiple countries. We can do localization in two dozen languages um, in voiceovers. We, we do QA testing and we do UI development. Um, we can provide additional art resources because we have a, a staff of 75 artists whose only job is to support all the other studios um, and they can be used for that. And we have a lot of expertise in the kinds of games that we're looking for. So we're looking for kind of military games that are free to play. So we can immediately go in and tell you if your free to play model is broken or if it's going to be perfect or if it needs polishing or anything like that. So there's a lot of resources that we bring into that last 20%. Um, in addition to the post-launch, you know, live operations and, and things that we're familiar with um, in user acquisition and advertising. All right. Thanks. We have one more question here. Hello. Uh, first of all, thank you for the panel. It was great. I have a question. What if a developer comes to you and uh, you like the game and you decide to work together? What then happens to the IP of the game? IP. Who owns the IP, right? If it's a pure publishing, do you hear me? Can, can we extend this a little bit to overall to the, the deal structures? Like what, what type of uh, commercial deals uh, you normally do? So IP ownership and, and then um, development rights further, like making sequels and then revenue shares, minimum guarantees, uh, Upfront payments. Okay, I'll let uh, Tatiana, Tatiana forgets, you know, the first, the first question is yes. still on, she forgets, so let her answer the first one. Uh, okay, so um, G5 either do pure publishing or work for hire. So, uh, in case of work for hire, it's obviously that IP belongs to G5. If it's a pure publishing deal, as you asked, uh, IP belongs to the developer. Hmm. And we, we have a ref share base, 50-50. That's a standard, but in a good business, everything is discussable. Uh, what was the... Um, Tatiana, so, so you mean that IP, I'm sorry, <laughs> that IP d d belongs to a developer. So yes. uh, let's say we come with a nice game to you, you like it, you publish it, we share revenue, and then we just, you know, publish a sequel ourselves. I mean, I heard such stories. Um, I'll publish a sequel ourselves, and that's okay. Uh, no, we have rights to review all the sequels at first, like um, the, the first night, right? Yeah. And uh, if we, um, in a certain period of time, decided that the sequel is not for us, we, we, you are free to, to do Okay, that. Uh, speaking about the first part, if IP is ours, can we, I don't know, make toys or like any franchise or something? Franchise? Hmm. You see? I wasn't so sure, <laughs> to be honest. There were no self practice, but no, we can't. You can't. Exactly. Sorry. But IP belongs to you. It's okay. You can keep it. <laughs> I think there's been, a, in, in the history, there's been a certain 
bird slingshot game that has taught the lesson to the publishers to hold on to the IP. Yeah, so sorry, like others can answer too. But yeah, uh, commercial terms. Um, uh, so are you offering, offering the uh, uh, developer uh, monetary investment for the uh, um, uh, development that they do for the game? Uh, and uh, are you committing to certain marketing budgets or, or other, other spending? Uh, well, uh, right now the market is really overwhelmed with uh, developers who already have uh, um, s investments uh, from somewhere. Um, sometimes uh, from uh, uh, from the um, I don't know maybe ventures. Um, uh, sometimes from like uh, I don't know somewhere. It doesn't matter. Uh, so we never invest in um, uh, development of uh, third-party third products because uh, we think that we'd better invest this money into our in-house products. So uh, well, uh, the rest is like uh, Tatiana said. Uh, we have a revenue share model. Uh, it can uh, vary from uh, 30 to 50 percent for us. Um, uh, also, um, we sign a contract only if uh, we and the developer are both happy with the deal and uh, we uh, talk about all the conditions uh, before signing the contract and uh, we uh, look into a lot of details. And uh, regarding IP, we never uh, ask a developer to transfer an IP because, uh, to be honest, uh, I haven't seen lately so many successful IPs that need to have uh, um, like a sequel. Sequel. Uh, the percentage, I mean, the chance of uh, having a sequel is so low that you don't need to have it. I mean, the IP. And uh, um, as I said previously, uh, we uh, treat uh, the developers as uh, like. Uh, like uh, equal partners, so we want to um, to have uh, their needs uh, also included in, in in the contract and uh, uh, in our deal. All right, thanks, uh, Miley. Uh, you taking a, taking a Western game to China involves quite a lot of risk taking on your side because uh, there is. Uh, Every game needs to get the government approval, and uh, it might take uh, anything from uh, three months to nine months, or, or even even longer if you are really unlucky. <laughs> and uh, there might be um, any any kind of sort of uh, surprises in in the process. Um, and and to get to that point, you already have to modify the game uh, to to fit the government requirements. Uh, and the market requirements. Um, so, wh what kind of deals you are you are offering to the uh, developers? They they are giving the huge Chinese market exclusivity to you, uh, but at the same time, you are also, um, uh, I guess, putting a lot of uh, resources into this uh, go-to-market process. So, tell us how how does that work? Mm -hmm. um, so, for deal terms, uh, we are very flexible. Um, uh, to depends on what will make the developer feel comfortable, and it also depends that um, who will be the support the development for the Chinese version. Uh, usually, we do provide minimum guarantee plus net revenue share, and then net is uh, hand, uh, handles all the development or marketing distributions and the government approval, etc. And for the government uh, approval, it's not easy, and it really depends that if the publisher uh, either have strong uh, relationship with the government or they are very experienced about how, you know what's the government's taste and make early preparations. So, for example, uh, when we uh, review the game, when we receive the bill. Um, before we enter to provide an offer, we actually already have a team who can like they they um, they evaluate the game and then can provide like a estimated report by the government that mm -hmm. this is the what need to be changed. 
uh, if we want to pass the approval, and then this will be uh, the uh, scenario that we will discuss, uh, discuss with the developer before we sign the contract. And the thing is that really to find a way for both sides to feel comfortable to work together. And uh, there's actually not such boundaries that, you know, okay, you, you do marketing and uh, I do development and, you know, all, all those bullshit, I don't care. But just uh, if you want to have a perfect, really, uh, like, partnership, you should really, like, work as close, as together as much you can. All right. Yeah. So that's a pro tip for everyone who is thinking of Chinese market. You have to start to talk to the Chinese publisher early on uh, because there will be a lot of, lot of requirements from the regulation side that uh, you need to take into account into the production phase already. Can we take one more question? Absolutely. Hello. Uh, you talk about uh, early prototypes. And I want to ask, and what about uh, not early, you say earlier the better, and uh, not about earlier, but uh, if a uh, development team tried to launch a game by themselves, and uh, they were not satisfied, were not satisfied, and uh, they want to try publisher now for this game, uh, I mean soft launch or maybe global launch for worldwide, what with these games? So you mean that, do you consider games that already been launched, right? Yeah. Do you? Tatiana, no. yes. no. you, are, okay. you are our star today. Please say so, uh, the counter question. If a developer launched the game and he's not satisfied with it? Maybe that's because the lack of the expertise. Maybe the, the game was good, but the developer was stupid, you know? Okay. Probably, if the developer is stupid, so that's a tricky it's question. A smart publisher. <laughs> Does it help? <laughs> I don't know, that's the question to you. Okay. Uh, Did you even consider? Uh, to tell the truth, according to my practice, no. Because okay. the first impression was already bad. And um, it's going to be a really tough question how to get the uh, promotion in this case, how to be featured if the game is like relaunched. Is it uh, very important? Is it like your strategy for a publisher to get featured? Is that uh, yeah, of course uh, everybody wants to be featured? Yeah. <laughs> so let's say it's a it's a game game that um, has a, a good LTV on a soft launch um, basis. Um, so the money money is there, um, but it doesn't seem to get a lot of uh, organic downloads, um, and uh, there's a the developer can't really get the, the CPI LTV on the right level. But so. they need a UA team, not the publisher with all this. Exactly, that was stuff. I was asking. If the game performs well and the LTV, LTV is high, I mean, why would you need someone who would take half of what you make? <laughs> you just need to buy a user and to just oh, adjust the, the, the... We had a gentleman okay. who was offering 30 to take only 30% there. <laughs> so. um. Uh, answering your question, um, if a developer comes to us with uh, bad metrics, uh, but uh, the product uh, has uh, very good potential, in uh, well, at least if we think so, uh, we need to review the product and understand whether we can help uh, a developer and make it better to uh, uh, have like a second round of soft launch. Uh, and uh, if it is so, uh, we can consider this product for publishing. If we can see that uh, uh, the, pro the product uh, cannot be uh, like uh, improved by us with, with our help, we don't think that uh, it is reasonable to... If even you cannot fix it, right? Yes, like we, with our <laughs> like expertise. <it. laughs> yeah. But, it, but uh, yeah, it's an option. Okay, Chris? So we actually had this happen to us. Um, a company uh, in China, at KingNet, made a mobile clone of World of Warships. It was exactly the same as our game, mostly. Um, uh, and... Um, they actually realized that the reason that they weren't monetizing that well is because they didn't have a, an IP that was well known. So they came to us and asked us, hey, can we take our copy of your game and license it <laughs> as the actual <laughs> game, right? Um, as, as World of Warships Blitz. 
and we spent uh, a good chunk of time and, and money looking at their game, um, reworking all of the, uh, uh, the monetization, which is still being worked on, and uh, you know, making sure that the actual, the assets really reflected not just a clone of our IP, but actually the, the real IP itself. Um, and then launched it as World of Warships and on mobile. And that was actually a really good fit for us because it helped them, it helped us, and you know, it's working out. So I think um, it's possible, it depends, I guess, on um, finding the right partner. So did you give them 50-50, Roger? -50 sure. <laughs> I can't tell you that. <laughs> Why would he care? <laughs> Seriously. Um, yeah, we probably have uh, time for one more question, if anyone has it. If not, then yes. Hi. Um, so the question about the, let's say, let's go to republishing, right? So if we have the situation when we launch the game with the publisher, and everything went smooth, so we like the metrics, the money is coming, but with some reason, we are not, like me as a developer, we are not satisfied with the publisher. So we have all the IP, we have the rights to break the contract. What are the chances that we will be able to re-sign the contract with the other publisher in your cases? Sorry. You publish the game with the publisher, you mm -hmm. get, everything is okay, you get the money, but you don't like the publisher. Yeah. What exactly you don't like with the um, publisher? Well, what, what, what is your, what's your expectation with the publisher? Let's, it, it should let, be a nice girl. Let's say the publisher doesn't provide us uh, the expertise for the further development of the product from the perspective of the game design or the, pro, or the monetization. Or okay, the, so you don't have yeah. enough planning in front of you. Yeah, so we are the good developer, we are not really good at monetization. We, uh -huh. we made a good game, but we want to make it better, and our current publisher can give, uh, give us that. <laughs> yeah, basically. We don't tell you nothing, here is your money, okay, so that's <laughs> nice. <laughs> yeah, just like, you know, this, this case. I'm pretty sure that you can find a way how to get out from the city. So does the publisher have any prejudice about the, you know, the, the first publisher or? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that sounds really odd, but. So it's like yeah, getting, it's like getting like a divorce. <laughs> it's like, it's it like is, getting a divorce, is. right? You, you have a you have to realize that you're probably part of the problem, <laughs> <laughs> but also when someone comes to you after a divorce, they're looking at you as a person who's now divorced. So the publisher is going to be looking at the same thing. Why did this go wrong? If they have friends at that publisher, they're going to find out. I think that's it. Thank you for the nice uh, wrap up. Thank you so much, guys. Uh, if uh, anyone has questions, feel free to come uh, close to them and ask everything in person. Maybe they will share more details then. And Friday, uh, don't miss our China panel. I'll be sitting next to Miley, and I think uh, we'll be probably diving deep into the, all the regulation stuff and, and all the other interesting things. Yes, thank you, Mikael. Thank, uh, thank you, guys. Thank you.